got it written. Little did I know, because I had promised Joel Mize a copy of the paper that I did in 1973 for a history class at UNA. I took the paper out of the filing cabinet, placed it in a box, in a folder box, inbox or whatever, uh, to go make a copy of it, and I have no idea what I did with it. I hunted through the entire filing cabinet system and 12 boxes of correspondence and still could not find it. So I luckily found my draft copy of the paper. So I didn't have to completely redo it. And by the way, I am not a descendant of Captain John Byler. He was my fifth great uncle. I descend from his older brother, Abraham Byler, who was an earlier settler of Bedford County, Tennessee, and had served as the High Sheriff of Carter County, Tennessee from 1799 to 1808. I don't know that it did him any good, although it did apparently, he made quite a bit of money out of it because he bought land all over Tennessee. And there was another brother, an older one, still the first child of the family that was born in 1765 and was the first representative from Lauderdale County to the Alabama legislature in 1819, Colonel Jacob Franklin Byler. And he plays a major part in the financing and development of the Byler Road, having bought a third interest in the road in 1824. I don't know how much he paid for it. It doesn't say, say it just says valuable, uh, ed, for valuable considerations. Probably he had loaned the money and he was forgiving the debt. There is a general misconception among most local historians that the act of 1819 was the act of the first road. However, that act was preceded by an act of the territorial legislature in 1818, which authorized the marking and surveying of a road connecting the shoals to the Tusca Tuscaloosa River. Now, whether that is the same route that was used in 1819 I have no idea. There is no map. There, is, there are no records of that initial report back to the legislature from the 1818 Act. The biggest problem in dealing with this thing is that the original records of the building of the road and all of the actions taken by the shareholders in the road have been lost. Uh, I can trace them up till 1912 when they were in the possession of Elizabeth Byler Dement of Athens. And according to her great niece, she donated those papers to the Presbyterian Church just east of uh, Blue Water, well, Elk River. Now, that congregation disbanded in the 1920s or early 30s, and according to her, the papers were sent to the Presbyterian Archives at Montreat, North Carolina. My research in 73 and 80 in correspondence with the people at the Montreat Archives, did not yield any results. I don't know whether the papers and the record books are still there, but are cataloged under a different name. And one of these days, I may be able to take a trip back to Montreat, North Carolina, 
and spend a couple of days pouring through their archives. You go to the next one. All right, let's, let's see. Yeah. Go backwards. The, uh, the biggest problem, go all the way back to the first, with settlers coming into this area is the fact that there is no easy transportation for materials and goods from the Tennessee Valley. Now, everybody believes that everything went up and down the river, but in dry weather, you couldn't get a boat up the river past Carrollville, Tennessee, which is almost the present site of Clifton, Tennessee. That's why most of the merchants in Florence had warehouses as early as 1820 and 21 in Carrollville, Tennessee, so that material coming up the river headed for a Florence destination in dry weather could offload their goods into a warehouse in Terrellville and then it was portaged from there down the Florence Road which is now the Cloverdale Road or Highway 157 in Alabama and the Weatherford Creek Road in Wayne County, Tennessee to Florence. I know in going through the early Florence Gazette newspapers in the 1820s, which still survive on microfilm, uh, I found numerous announcements that uh, John Simpson and later his son had received uh, a wagon load of goods coming in from Louisville or from Cairo, Illinois on a steamship into Carrollville, Tennessee, and that the wagons would be in Florence usually within a week of their arrival in Carrollville. The biggest problem further up the river is, of course, the shoals. We tend to forget that now, looking at the river, it wide with Wilson Lake and Pickwick Lake, that at the time you could actually walk across the river in low water. The biggest hassle was trying to get across the river from Florence over to uh, South Florence on the south side and then into Tuscumbia and further south. So the idea of connecting the Shoals area with Tuscumbia, I mean Tuscaloosa, by road was a valuable access which allowed people to load a dray wagon with whatever goods they were shipping, haul them to Tuscaloosa, and put them on a steamship there for the port of Mobile, which would save at least a week transport time going down the river, Tennessee River, to the Ohio, and then down the Ohio to the Mississippi, and then down the Mississippi to New Orleans. That first act of the legislature never came to fruition, I mean, the territorial legislature. The next problem you ran into was the mountains of the uh, Highland Plateau, which is south of Tuscumbia. You can easily see them from nearly anywhere along 72. Uh, those prohibited easy transport of climbing up on top of the ridge with a heavy load. So the idea was to build a road, or at least mark it out, that would connect a major highway in Lauderdale County, the Jackson Military Road, with the ports at Northport and Tuscaloosa in Tuscaloosa County. So uh, right after Alabama became a state in December 14th, I think it is, of 1819, the uh, legislature, in collusion of members, I believe, 
because I believe that John Walker's father-in-law was the president of, or the speaker of the House of the first legislature. He was, in fact, the president of the 1819 Constitutional Convention, John Walker of Huntsville. Uh, and his brother, oldest, John Byler's oldest brother, John Jacob Franklin Byler, who was a representative from Lauderdale County, decided to build a road from Jackson's Military Road on, in Lauderdale County down to Tuscaloosa. And since neither any, well, neither of the counties south of the river had the funds to build a road into the mountains up on the Appalachian Plateau, they colluded to get John Byler to form a turnpike company to build the road, clear the right of way, build the bridges, and all the other work needed to build the road from the south boundary of Township 8 on the Huntsville grid to the northern boundary of Township 18, which was in Tuscaloosa County. That's about 60 miles. Now, Township 8 is, oh, about six miles or a little longer south of Mount Hope in Lawrence County, which is the site of the 66-mile tree west of Huntsville. The first toll gate for the road was actually built at the top of the hill or the mountain south of Mount Hope on land that John Byler actually owned and was known as the Byler uh, toll gate to begin with. Now, from there, the next toll gate was created in the 18, later 1820s at Etheridge or Eldridge, Alabama, where John Byler's son-in-law, Thornton, uh, Eldridge Thornton Mallard, owned a land and a farm, and he opened a toll gate at that point. I can find no records in the records of Lawrence County to, or even the state records, to indicate that there was a southern toll gate at the terminus of the toll road. It may be in the Tuscaloosa County records because when John Bollard died in 1824 <coughs> as the result of a fever contracted by when building and surveying the road, he left a large family of 10 children who each became a one-tenth owner in the turnpike charter. And the guardianship records provided most of the income figures and the records that I was able to access to determine what was going on with the road. Anyway, so t since the road was started in 1819, it was to run originally from Samuel Craig's Tavern on the south side of Shoals Creek, where the Jackson Military Road crossed Shoals Creek. There's no reference to it being a ferry, but there is evidence that there was a covered bridge over Shoals Creek at that location. The piers for the bridge are still standing in Shoals Creek at that location, even to this day. The rock, huge rock piers. Now, the road was to follow a route, a generally southern route, to Bainbridge, toward Bainbridge, and it would cross the Tennessee River by ferry opposite Bainbridge, enter Bainbridge, and then take a generally southeasterly line from Bainbridge to the county line between Franklin and 
Lawrence counties. This is currently known as, well, the road that it, it made at the county line is currently known as County Line Road and follows the western boundary, original western boundary of Franklin County all the way down to the southern boundary of Franklin and Lawrence as it was before the war. The responsibility for this road between Samuel Craig's Tavern and the Bainbridge Ferry fell to the Lauderdale County Road Commissioner as directed by the state legislature. However, in reading through the Road Commissioner's records that survive, and they are not complete, uh, it appears that the road was not built until 1827 when the Alabama legislature again ordered the road commissioner or the inferior courts of Lauderdale County to appoint commissioners to view out and mark the road between Samuel Craig's and Bainbridge. Apparently sometime in 1827 or 1828 the road was actually opened down to the river and I know it was used to transport pig iron in the 1830s from Samuel Van Leer's furnace on Butler Creek east of, I mean west of Iron City in 1832 and 1833 and 1834 because those records show up in the uh, equity court records of Lauderdale County in the Union Bank, Union Planters Bank of New Orleans versus Samuel Van Leer, a furnace operator, when Van Leer declared bankruptcy in 1836. From Bainbridge, the road generally went eastward to the county line intersecting the county line about where Old Brick Presbyterian Church is today. From there, it followed the county line between Lawrence and Franklin, at least to the 66-mile tree at Mount Hope and at the bottom of the mountain. Now the road from the bottom of the mountain to the top of, uh, on the plateau has changed in the last 30 years because the first time I drove it in 1973, you could still see where they had used dynamite on the, the solid stone of the, the hill mm -hmm. to cut the road through and make a S-shaped or a winding road to the top. It was a gradual slope and made transport not really easy but a lot easier than trying to climb up the entire length of the hill on a straight run. There has been a, they've gone through now and built a new county road on the same route as the old one and the route no longer zigzags up as much as it did in 1973. It's a little harder to get up through there with a horse or oxen and wagon. When you got to the top of the mountain, you ran into the beginning of the turnpike. Now, according to the original act of 1819, the, the entire length of the road was to be 12 feet wide cleared of all stumps and trees, and as straight as possible. All mud holes were to be filled or paved over, and not with asphalt, but with truncheons of split trees, much like the floors in early schools were made of truncheons. The Bridges and the drainage involved was rather expensive. 
I found a bill from the 1848 period where one of the overseers charged the county almost $13 at that time to haul six loads of gravel and put at the, on the road to, at, uh, at a place where it was muddy and hard to pass through. That was, of course, uh, an area of the road that was still a public road. It was not part of the turnpike. The commissioners appointed by the state law were John B. Cobles or Cobb, I can't read the original writing on that, Obadiah Walker, William Bryant, George Vandiver, Nicholas King, and Vance M. Cunningham from Lawrence County, Levi Gist, Richard Ellis, Samuel R. Harris, William Skinner, William Mullen, and George Russell from Franklin County. They were to meet after the first meeting of the county courts in Franklin and Lawrence County in January of 1820 to discuss the route of the road and to view out the route and mark it for the public section between Bainbridge and the bottom of the mountain south of Mount Hope. This section was actually opened for general use in late 1822. Baller and Associates were given the right to turnpike the road between the top of the mountain south of Mount Hope and the area of New Lexington and were given the right to collect toll and control the turnpike for 12 years. I tried to find the names of the overseers who were appointed by the various counties along the road to see if John Byler was complying with the act of the legislature. It's interesting to note that he was required to pay the cost of these commissioners, so you know good and well that they were going to approve the condition of the road since he was paying them rather than the state. The toll rates in 1819 for the road are listed there on the, the screen. Four-wheel carriages and team was 75 cents. Two-wheel carriage, 50 cents. A man and a horse, 50 cents. Each additional pack horse was 12 and a half cents. A loose horse was six and one quarter cents. Each head of cattle was one cent, and each head of hogs and sheep was one cent. Obviously, there was an awful lot of traffic of people moving horses and sheep and, and cows up and down the road because the revenue from that period amounted to about $600 up until, eight, well, at least between 1822 and 1825. Bottler ran into a problem, though, with the turnpike. It was costing more money to build than he was able to collect on the tolls at the time. He was allowed, he was permitted by the state to collect half toll until the road was completely finished Apparently, he was not collecting enough of the half toll to pay for the cost of the building of the road. Because in 1821, they were changed the rates of the toll on the road. And that was for a full toll. If you even look at a half a toll, that would have increased it a little enough, hopefully, to pay for the road. In 1824, he was forced to sell one-third of his interest in the turnpike to his brother, Jacob Franklin Byler, 
of Lauderdale County for, as I said earlier, valuable consideration. I have been unable to find any record where Colonel Jacob disposed of his one-third interest in the road at least until his death in 1846. And the records, if they exist at all, are in the Cooper County, Missouri Courthouse where he died in 1846. One other thing I forgot, exemptions of people who were traveling the road who were exempt from paying tolls were ministers of the gospel, persons going to and from court and on other public business, those indigenous and others unable to pay were oftentimes given free passage according to local stories from the people who later lived along the road. This is a list of the earnings given by the Orphan's Court records between 1825 and 1835. I don't, could not find the records for 1833, nor could I find the records for 1835. Using what I knew of who were the minors of the heirs, which would account for two-thirds of ownership in the road in the various years and the reports given to the court, I was able to generate the total revenue from the road. And this is net revenue. This is the actual profits from the road. And you can tell that in the 10-year period between 1825 and 1835, the total revenue on the road was $5,891.49 and two-thirds cents. In today's money, that'd be a little over $206,000. Obviously, it still was not enough money to keep the road going. There was an act of the legislature in the 18, late 1828, or about 1834, I believe it was, that made the portion of the Byler Road in Tuscaloosa County, all of it, a public road and the responsibility of the road commissioner's court. The family still controlled the section, the, the toll section, between south of Mount Hope and the uh, northern boundary of Tuscaloosa County. Now, Joel Mize, in his book on the Byler Road, has an extra toll gate in Tuscaloosa County on the map called the Byler Gate. I don't know who actually ran this, and I don't know when it was opened. Uh, it doesn't show up in any of the estate records as having revenue generated, and it may have been an effort to collect toll on a part of the road after 1851. I need to do some more research in Tuscaloosa County, and I'm afraid I have not had an opportunity to do that. In 1831, the very advanced thinkers of Tuscumbia built the first railroad in the south. It was just a, a branch line that ran from Tuscumbia to Tuscumbia Landing on the Tennessee River, but it was enough of an interest that it generated the Tuscumbia and Decatur Railroad, which was finished in 1832 or 33. Both dates are given. That was one of the major competitions to the road, as well as one of the major feeds to the road. People in northeastern Alabama could now ship their goods to Decatur on a boat. It was transferred in Decatur to the railroad, which could be brought and shipped out of Tuscumbia Landing on the Tennessee River, bypassing the shoals or it could be offloaded in Leeton, put on a dray wagon, and hauled overland 
to Tuscaloosa, then put on another ship and sent to Mobile. The family was smart enough to realize that they had a viable transportation route from Tuscaloosa to Mobile through the Black Warrior and then after Demopolis, the Tom Bigby River. They operated a steamboat on the Black Warrior River between 1830 and 1848, as far as I have been able to determine. It was called the Indian Queen. And I've done a Google search and have never been able to find a photograph of it. So it either burned or wrecked somewhere on the river sometime after 1848. Because family correspondence indicates that it was still in existence and still operating as late as 1848. The next big item in the competition to the road was the building and opening of the first Muscle Shoals Canal in the 1830s. This bypassed the shoals and allowed river travel to move up and down the river without having to encompass and encounter the shoals that ran from basically Florence to almost opposite Cortland. This gave people a much easier water route to ship goods both into North Alabama and out of North Alabama. The road declined following 1835 with the opening of the canal and the railroad. There was still traffic on the road. I know there is a court case in 1848 where it is said that the revenue on the road amounted to around $9,000 for that specific year. But the majority of the freight being hauled was now hauled by steam or by rail. This is an account of the earnings from what I could determine between 1837 and 1843. After 1843, there were no more miners in the family as heirs, and the road was fixing to go into a major upheaval. Most of the family was moving away from Lawrence County. They were moving to Arkansas and Texas to take advantage of free land from the Bounty Land Acts. And those that remained were squabbling over the collection of toll from various toll gates. This slide shows the location of the 1880 shoals. But what is interesting, this is one of the earliest maps that I have found that shows the actual location of Bainbridge on the south side of the river. And it's detailed enough to provide an accurate location. The 1916 geodetic survey maps show the location but it is not precisely located as re in reference to the river. It's just there. Uh, but this is by the Corps of Engineers showing the work progress on the 1880 uh, canal, the second Shoals Canal, and Bainbridge was here. What creek is across the river there? They could go across that's Shoals Creek. Okay, well, that's what I was trying to get. Yeah, that there, because that's where the, the canal bridged the river and was above the, the creek, above, bridged the creek. Then there's smaller creek on the south side, which is McCurdy Creek, yep. now known as Donegan Slough. Oh, yeah. And I figure that they used that creek coming up through there uh, to gain access to the the top of the, the ridge or the plateau there on the south side of the river because it looks like there was on some of the earlier maps, the 1840, 1844, 1848 La Tourette map of Alabama shows that there is a road generally coming up this area and then moving over to the, the county line 
just about oh, opposite where Brick Church is located. And then later, the road going from Brick Church to Bainbridge was changed so that the route of the road would go on to South Florence after the building of the uh, bridge across the river at Florence in the 1830s, late 1830s. I can remember in 1973 when I was transversing the county road through the Bankhead Forest after I had ensured that the bootleggers and the marijuana growers were under control. I was warned not to go in 1972. Uh, don't need to be wandering the woods down there. The having run into a federal agent stakeout in Tennessee looking for a cemetery and if I hadn't known the sheriff of the county personally I might not be standing here today. <laughs> they might have figured I was the one growing the marijuana. But the road was in places, like I said, paved with split logs or truncheons. This allowed mud holes and soft spots in the, the route to be transversed by heavily loaded wagons without the wagons getting mired in the mud. So later, the, like, they used gravel. And let me see if I can find the documentation that I stuck in here. Eh, nope. Yeah, here we go. In 1844, I, as I mentioned earlier, Robert Ambrose was one of the overseers on the Tuscumbia, I mean Tuscaloosa Road, which can be read as the Byler Road. And he billed the commissioners for eight days hauling rock on the Tuscaloosa Road, finding wagon and team with hand, and marking two mile posts and whatever the other reads, and putting up the same cedar post for a sum of $12, which he billed to the, the county of Lawrence as one of the overseers on the road. There's an interesting story about finding this bill. In 1970, Two, late 72, a lot of the re loose records in the courthouse in Moulton, the Lawrence County Courthouse, were being stolen and put up for sale on various auction sites. The state captured the people and the records were returned to the sheriff of Lawrence County, not to the individual uh, offices of the probate judge or the commissioner's court or anything else. I happened to be dating the niece of the sheriff of Lawrence County at the time and gained access to all of the evidence that had been seized and also had access to a copying machine <laughs> and I went to town I copied 500 and something documents that one day, and this was one of them. The other were a list of the commissioner's orders, commissioner's court orders, appointing overseers for various sections of the first road, including the turnpike. However, I cannot find those copies at this time. I know I still have them. They're in a box somewhere. But who knows where? This one just happened to be in a file on the Baller Road. John Baller's son, Alfred Hampton Baller, managed to gain control of the road by owning three and a half shares of the 10 parts of the two-thirds remaining ownership in the road. 
And in 1844, before his death in 1846, he worked in the legislature to extend the, the uh, charter for the road for an additional 10 years. It had already been extended to 1841 and would now be extended by an act of the legislature to 1851 and guaranteeing the right of the heirs of John Byler to maintain control of the turnpike and the collection of tolls. However, he died in 1846 and his father-in-law, Charles Barker, became the administrator of his estate. And he had five minor heirs. Sometime in 1847, the rest of the family <laughs> colluded with another member of the family to open a new toll gate about a mile south of the original Byler toll gate at the head of the top of the mountain south of Mount Hope. And this was called the Barker toll gate. And according to the original bill filed in Chancery Court in Lawrence County, the people from, that were controlling the Barker toll gate were dissuading those trying to pay tolls at Byler toll gate and indicating that they should come on to the Barker toll gate and pay tolls. That chancery bill lists all of the people who own shares in the Byler Road in 1848. There were 10 of the surviving children of John Byler and his wife. One of the surviving child, children, Margaret, who had married Joseph Ritchie, they had sold half of their interest in the, the road, one half share, and moved to Mississippi. William McDonald of Lawrence County bought that half share and became the only supposed outsider to have uh, control over the turnpike portion of the road. Although I suppose, and I uh, don't have proof, that it was his daughter who married John Walker Byler. Love these names, they all fold together. Uh, the grandson of John Byler, Alfred Hampton's son who lived in Hancock County, later Winston County. There was evidence that John Walker Byler, when he was a member of the Alabama legislature in 1860, and later the Alabama Confederate legislature in 1861, was promoting, extending the charter of the road so that they could control the toll on the road or collect the toll on the road. However, with the outbreak of the Civil War, he formed a cavalry unit in the Confederate Army called Byler's Cavalry, and they promptly went off to war and he promptly got shot and killed, thus ending any involvement in the direct control of the road that John Byler and his associates had built in the 1820s. After the war, the entire route became a public road and was controlled by the County Road Commissioner's Office Court with the people who lived along the road being called to service to keep the road operational, keep it clear, and keep it in good working order. There was no more toll collected after the war. But during the war, the road saw a tremendous amount of activity. You had General Wilson, James Wilson, that came in on the raid to Winston County where he found ample support, Union General. And even Confederate General John Bell Hood 
use the northern portion of the road, part of it, in his advance on Nashville in 1864 because they put up a truncheon bridge at Bainbridge to cross the river since the Confederates had burned the Tennessee River Bridge at Florence. That was Wilson's raid in North Alabama was one of the largest cavalry exercises in the history of warfare with 6,000 men on horseback and all of the accompanying baggage. It probably looked about like uh, Armageddon to the people in Lawrence County and in Franklin County. One of the biggest problems in doing any kind of history is the lack of records. I've found in the last 50 years of doing family history research that most original records or copies thereof went west with the children of the people who lived here. I found a lot of Bible records in Texas that detail the history of families in Lauderdale and in Tennessee. In fact, one cousin kind enough sent me a Bible record that proved three generations back to 1740 on one of my mother's family lines. And otherwise, I would have been lost because the records of Lawrence County, Tennessee, which supposedly detail the estates of those people, are missing. They're not even there's a blank page in the record book, and it just says what it was for, but it doesn't say what the information was or who the heirs were. It just left blank. And in Lauderdale County, you run into the same situation. And of course, Colbert County didn't exist till 1867, and Franklin County burned to the ground in 1898 or... Hmm? 94, okay. Fayette County is in the same boat. I don't know about Marion County. I've never been to the courthouse there. Lawrence County surprisingly has, or had until the theft started, the most complete set of court records of any of the counties in North Alabama. Going back to 1819, 1818, and they also had all of the Northwest District Chancery Court records which had been moved from Cortland to Moulton. Now I don't know how much of that survives. I know I spent one day in the basement of the Chancery Court clerk's office at the courthouse in Lawrence in uh, Moulton and when I came out I was black from head to toe and my shoes were wet from the water that was seeping into the basement and the records were so dusty. You'd haul one of them up the spiral staircase to the office and beg them to let you copy a part of it. But there were the records from Chancery Court in Lauderdale County are also in those records. And that's a major find because I found an estate settlement from 1836 that involved a patriot of the Texas Revolution that, who was killed in 1836 in the Battle of San Jacinto, Texas, and was a Lauderdale County native, one of Uncle Jacob's grandsons. <laughs> but anyway, the road has been a prominent feature in Alabama history for the last hundred and, what, 70 years? Well, nearly 200 years, actually. 200 years. And after the Civil War, it wasn't known as the Byler Road. It was known as the Old Boiler Road. And Boiler is an approximation of the original French-German pronunciation of the name as it is spoken in down Switzerland 
Bayara. Sort of like you're saying it with a little bit of indigestion. <laughs> and it became boiler in the records, and you'll see it spelled that way in the county court records. I know the whiskey, my... The whiskey makers of Weston County and Lawrence County uh, knew about boilers, and that's one of the reasons why it got perverted over. Oh, yes, the that's true, road. yeah, the old boiler road. I know my great aunts visited the uh, visited Haleyville in the early 1908 period. They took the railroad from Iron City, Tennessee to Sheffield and then caught the railroad on further south. And they visited with a Mr. Clear in Haleyville who ran the Clear Hotel. And I tried to get them to tell me if they knew of any connection. And I have since found a connection and lost it again but he apparently was a descendant of John Byler. And another one of interest that ties in with this business of transportation, Alfred Hampton's Byler, Alfred Hampton Byler's daughter, Mary, married a Roberts in Colbert County, or Franklin County at the time. And their daughter married William Milton Shrigley in Colbert County and they became the son of Edgar Victor Shrigley of Texas, who was a major proponent of the Tennessee Tom Bigby Canal all through the 1940s, 50s, and 60s through his connection to various and sundry members of Congress. I had the honor of corresponding with Mr. Shrigley for 10 years until his death in 19. Oh, 78, I think it was. And he, I even have a copy of his little book on the history of the Shrigley family in Colbert County. The, uh, but he was a major push. He gave a major push because of the influence of the Byler Road on him. Because he spent many a day with his aunt, great aunt, uh, Elizabeth Byler, Dement in Athens, the woman who had all of the original records for the building of the Byler Road. And he said in one letter that he remembered reading through John Byler's diaries and records of the building of the road and all the trouble they had up in the, uh, in the what is now the Bankhead Forest 